Hi, I'm Lauren Thomas. In this lecture video, we'll talk about the approach called appreciative inquiry. This is the only AI allowed in this course. I'm not talking about artificial intelligence. I'm talking about appreciative inquiry. What is appreciative inquiry? It's an asset-based approach to talk, to have dialogue with whoever you're serving, be it individuals, organizations, communities, by focusing your dialogue, your questions, your version of the interview, uh, focusing on the positive uh, so that you can uncover that individual, that organization's existing strengths, their existing contributions, their advantages, the benefits of making a particular change, and all of this is to create a force of possibility and flourishing for that individual or that organization's future. In a nutshell, it's a process of communicating uh, to engage the person or the people that you're serving in a way that will allow them to change in a, a way that's honoring their own life. The origin of appreciative inquiry goes back into the 1980s. So in the 1980s, management uh, consultants would be hired by corporations when there was some sort of culture cha change that needed to be made. Um, and often these consultants would come in and they would ask uh, employees, they'd ask uh, mid-level managers, they'd ask the CEOs, to talk about, well, what's the problem? What, what are you uh, deficient in? And what David Cooperwriter and Suresh Srivastava shared in the late 1980s was that there is a different approach to these consultations. Um, they constructed the appreciative inquiry model, and it was a real uh, significant shift in the way management consultants uh, communicated to the companies that they were working for. And their uh, way of uh, approaching change was that we need to refocus on what works in the corporation and on what people really care about, what they're really good at. Because this, this model, what it does is it assumes that the questions that we ask will tend to focus our attention on a, in a particular direction. And that the organizations, no matter what questioning, whatever line of questioning you take someone down, they're going to go in that direction uh, based on the questioning that the question that's being asked. So the essence behind appreciative inquiry is that every word in a question matters. How an interviewer asks a question to someone, an interviewee. It can influence how that interviewee perceives their own power and capability for the future. And this change in questioning can shift the narrative and it avoids unintentional negative bias that may exist for the interviewer or the interviewee. And do you notice that this seems a little similar to asset framing? So appreciative inquiry and asset framing come from the same spirit. Um, asset framing is about defining people by their aspirations and contributions, whereas appreciative inquiry is about engaging people with questions that focus on their core strengths and existing contributions and aspirations. So again, this goes to that spirit of recognizing, acknowledging that negative bias exists in humans. What we appreciate, what we focus on will grow. What we don't focus on might just get worked out in the end once we've developed enough capabilities and self-efficacy and competence in our skill sets that the things that seem so problematic in our life right now might actually start to be perceived as feasible to handle. In this brief video, one of the founders of Appreciative Inquiry, David Cooperwriter, discusses there, there is a double meaning behind the term appreciation. Take a listen. We're going to go through a couple of um, questions that you may have had in your mind at some point in your life that uh, are 
around the topic of health habits and building health, healthy habits, um, you'll notice that the thoughts in your mind are often uh, in that sort of negative biased space. Um, certainly not appreciative inquiry, certainly not um, framed with your assets in mind. So let's go through a couple of these sort of questions that you may unintentionally ask yourself that aren't going to lead you in a, in a, in a positive direction. You know, if one of your health habits that you're working on in this course is around healthy eating, uh, you may have a thought in your mind that might sound like, ugh, why haven't I stopped eating fast food? And that type of question, again, signals you that oh, you're the kind of person who makes decisions that are, that you're a victim, you're, you're do, making decisions based on outside forces. It positions your body as something that you've just got to whip into shape and, and it's such a challenge to maintain it. Um, and this may lead you to think of your body and have a relationship with your body that is shameful and guilt-ridden, right? Um, but an appreciative inquiry, um, a, a, a better way, a more a positive way to focus on your strengths, maybe uh, rearranging that question and honoring the tone of what that question is really trying to get at, what the underscore of that question is really trying to get at. And instead ask yourself, hmm, what foods do I enjoy eating that will honor my body? Um, by asking that question and helping yourself recognize that the faulty thoughts in your head need to leave is reframing that question, realigning that question so it's really appreciating what you bring to the table. It helps to signal that you make really good decisions based on your own values, um, that you have a body that's worthy to invest in, and it could lead you to a curious, more honest reflection of the state of where you're at when it comes to your relationship with food. Here's another one. Instead of the, you know, the thought that's in your mind that might say, oh, why didn't I go to the gym today? Oof. <laughs> uh, you can even hear the tone as I ask that question. Why didn't you go to the gym today? Why didn't I go to the gym today? Urgh. Um, it signals that you're being forced by some outside entity. Um, it signals that your body is uh, deficient and that you can't be trusted. Um, it may lead to feelings of exhaustion, guilt, shame, even dare I say a word that I don't believe exists, laziness. Um, you might start to identify as, oh, I'm so lazy. Um, if we were to realign that question in a way that is much more appreciative of what you bring to the table um, might be something like, what is my favorite way to move my body? Um, maybe what I'm doing right now, going to the gym or you know, doing this particular exercise isn't what I wanna do. Um, so it signals that this line of question gives you a choice um, and it positions your body and your time as something um, of an asset to invest in and that this may lead to feelings of delight as you plan for the future of, well, what do I want to actually do? Huh, I've never thought about it. And again, this allows you to reestablish a better, more positive relationship with your body and how you move. Here's the last question. Um, you've likely had this thought in your mind, this faulty negative thought in your mind, question in your mind that says, why do I keep procrastinating on this assignment? <laughs> um, which again, it signals that you may be making a decision out of guilt. Um, and you may not, you may seem to be someone who is dreading this activity. And it positions your character as someone, again, that you, you can't be trusted. You can't trust yourself, um, that you are somehow immoral, that you are procrastinating. It's so value-laden. That's so, so, such a negative, entrenched word. Um, instead, if we were to realign that way of questioning and instead say something like, hmm, what component of this assignment feels doable right now? What it does is it helps you to take inventory of your own state of being, it 
allows you to scan through this assignment, which is already a step forward, and help you break it down, which is some real uh, executive planning skills being used. It signals that you're in control and that you can make an independent decision. And this may lead to a snowball effect that once you take one feasible component of this assignment, perhaps you can do a little bit more. You know, I'm just gonna write that first paragraph, that's it. And then once you get into it, you may actually find, oh, I got this, no big deal. I can, I can handle the rest of this from now on because you've built that skill set, you've built that muscle memory. A few years ago, um, Serena Williams was in the Australian Open and she was, after she won, she was asked a pretty negative question um, by a sports journalist. And what I so appreciate about her response is that she put the sports journalist in his place and said, no, I don't accept that. I'm a very kind person to myself. And uh, she really uh, emphasizes that idea of what we focus on creates a narrative that she was not gonna in indulge in that line of questioning. So the key thing to remember around appreciative inquiry is that we, as professionals, no matter who we serve, whether it's individuals or a community or working in, a, in an organization, we can learn how to be curious, uh, respectful, and appreciative. Uh, and what that does, and as we ask questions, as we engage in conversations with people, it can really make a difference in how that person that we're serving, that individual or that uh, community member that we're serving, it can help them reframe uh, the way that they perceive their own capability and their potential. Um, my goodness, that's so powerful. Thanks so much for joining me in this lecture video on appreciative inquiry.